Okay, okay, well, I'd just first of all like to thank um, Ming Ai for inviting me to speak here. Is that better? Um, my name is Diana Ye. Um, yeah, okay, my PowerPoint's coming up there. My paper today is called Staging China, Chinoiserie and Racial Order. Um, so in the interest of time and lunch, because I think we're all getting hungry, um, I will just launch straight into the paper. Okay, so... Um, on the 27th of November 1934, a traditional Chinese play, Lady Precious Dream, premiered at the Little Theatre off the Strand. While there had been plays done in a Chinese manner on the English stage before, Lady Precious Dream was the first written by a Chinese playwright. And in within months, its author, Shi Yi Sheng, an unknown student from China, was hurled into worldwide fame. He became known as the first Chinese stage director ever to work in the West End and on Broadway. And Dimia Shung, his wife, was later to become the first Chinese woman in Britain to publish a full-length work of either fiction or autobiography in English. As I show in my recent book, although the Shungs became huge celebrities worldwide, they continually faced challenges in becoming accepted as modern subjects as they were continually constructed as the exotic other and valued only as representatives of traditional Chinese culture and customs. Um, but in my talk today, I'd like to discuss specifically the success of Shung's um, play Lady Precious Stream in the context of both the conference theme, Thinking Chinese, and British chinoiserie fashions in the early 20th century. <coughs> Chinoiserie conventionally um, refers to a collection of objects or a taste for decoration in the Chinese style. Whether a Western or Chinese product, it signals a purely European idea of China, either the fabulous cafe or, more widely, any fanciful interpretation of Chineseness, and is therefore inseparable from wider imagi imaginings of the so-called Orient. But in the context of the theme of thinking Chinese, I want to examine chinoiserie as a powerful social force that has profound implications on the, on the lives of those defined as Chinese. So by examining the production, staging and reception of Lady Precious Stream through its lens, I'd like to highlight chinoiserie as compromising the very idea of thinking Chinese by disavowing the capacity of Chinese people to think be creative and become accepted as producers of modern art and knowledge. So when Shung arrived in London in 1933, he was aware of chinoiserie constructions of China um, as a fantastical and fanciful cafe, and he hoped to counter such ideas with a modern realist play that he had written called Mamon, which was essentially a critique of avarice in contemporary China. Having translated the works of George Bernard Shaw, he sent him the play for comment. Shaw replied, A modern realistic play written by a foreigner has little chance of the English stage for the time being. So, he said, try something different, something really Chinese and traditional. So Shaw's role was clearly to embody difference. And he decided to adapt um, a Peking opera for the English stage, choosing a love story of a prime minister Prime Minister's daughter who runs away with the family's gardener, and he named it Lady Precious Stream. It took him about a year to find a producer, but eventually the actress Nancy Price decided to take it on, and here she is with her Pekingese dog. Now, this is not incidental. Sarah Chang has pointed out that the early 20th century fashion among women of owning a Pekingese dog was an important expression of upper-class and imperialistic British femininities. So Price took, partook in the fashion for things Chinese and understood its allure. So she told Shung, this play is going to be the greatest success London has had in some time. And she was right. So Lady Precious Stream was an overnight phenomenon. It ran in a West End for almost a thousand nights and became the society show. Um, the Queen and other members of the royal family attended, and critics hailed Shung as the new Shakespeare. So here he's playing up to the model minority, in a sense. Um, and here he is with um, George Bernard Shaw at the Malvern Theatre Festival. And his other admirers included J.B. Priestley and H.G. Wells, um, who were followers of eugenics, actually. And he also knew actors such as Vivian Lee and John Gilgood. 
Chung also became part of a transatlantic network of artists and intellectuals. Don't know if any of you recognise him. He is with um, Chang Yi, who's the author of the Silent Traveller series of books, and also uh, Liu Hai Su, who was um, a celebrated modern Chinese artist. And here he is um, with um, the film stars Paul Robeson and Anna Mae Wong, and the famous Peking opera star Mei Lan Fang outside Claridge's. But Shung's fame did not stop at the UK. So here he is with um, Demia, his wife, heading off to the US in the company of Hollywood stars, um, including Tilly Losh, who was soon to star in um, Pearl Buck's version, uh, sorry, the film version of Pearl Buck's The Good Earth. And finally, um, here are Demia and Shi Yi with none other than Eleanor Roosevelt, who visited backstage a Lady Precious Dream when it was performed in New York. So the question is, what made Shung's play so successful? Well, it seems um, that Shaw had been right. Western audiences were hungry for something, as he put it, really Chinese and traditional. And this is what they saw in Shung's play. Yet, in fact, this was at odds with Shung's own vision of his play. Because although he kept to a non-naturalistic tradition of the Chinese stage, he nonetheless wanted to modernise his adaption in Ad, sorry, adaptation in various ways. The language of the play, for example, was adapted to suit the British theatre-going audiences of the 1930s, and is full of phrases such as, um, you little minx, henpeck husbands, or you silly darling. But most importantly, Shung also wanted to, um, through the play, to represent a modern Chinese national identity, and to challenge Shinoiserie constructions of China and the Chinese. For though by the 1930s fears of a yellow peril had subsided, racist constructions of the Chinese continued to circulate in popular culture. So men as emasculated servants or tyrannical fathers and evil Fu Manchu types who delighted in cruelty and sexual depravity, and women as subjugated wives and daughters or exotic vamps. Even scholarly perspectives of the Chinese wrestled with China's apparent exceptionalism in its purported violence and lack of humanity. So Shung sought to challenge such constructions by creating a world of independent yet virtuous women and perhaps foolish but not evil men. He allowed, for example, the willful <coughs> precious stream to choose her own husband and also erased the polygamy um, depicted in a stock version of the play. But he also sought to update Cathay through modern incursions, sorry, representing the West's imperial interest in and looting of China via the militarily and sexually aggressive princess of the Western regions, depicted here in the helmet. By the time the play was staged, however, what came to the fore was the play's traditional Chineseness. Um, Nancy Price's theatre was, in fact, famous for disseminating modern, Euro um, modern innovations in European theatre, including those that drew on the traditions of uh, China and Japan. Yet when it came to Lady Precious Stream, it drew on long-established traditions of shinoiserie to make the play really Chinese and traditional. So Price advertised Lady Precious Stream as a first European production of a traditional Chinese play, it was complete with traditional Chinese music, although this was in fact reduced to the use of gongs. And in the publicity, Price met also made much of the supposedly authentic, in her words, exceedingly precious costumes from China, as you see here, the interesting and symbolic Chinese hanging tapestries, wine pots and cups which were supposedly white jade of the Ming era, and she even had fans um, made to advertise the play, although they used um, Edwardian-era Japanese fans. But by using things supposedly Chinese to authenticate the production, Price transformed Lady Precious Stream into a purportedly realistic representation of elite Chinese life as imagined via Tales of Cathay. As such, the production was at odds with Shung's original intentions to present a modern national identity via the non-naturalistic symbolism of the Chinese stage. As you may have noticed, however, Price's interest in China did not necessarily extend to its people. By this time, East Asian actors had performed in the West End, most famously Anna Mae Wong alongside Laurence Olivier, who you see here, in Basil Dean's The Circle of Chalk. 
Though Sheng's later attempts to cast Chinese players in Lady Precious Stream suggest his objection to yellow faced practices, only white performers were cast, despite their lack of experience with Chinese dramatic conventions. Yet this did nothing to disrupt the perceived authenticity of this traditional Chinese play. Carol Coombe was, it seems, particularly adept at conveying oriental charm. Her transformation into Precious Stream was, according to the press, flawless. Her fair hair is completely hidden under a straight fringe short black wig. Her eyes are made up to be quite Mongolian, while a line here and there alters the contours of her face until she appears thoroughly Chinese. But the chinoise reproduction paid off. Soon news circulated that none other than Queen Mary, who had a wonderful collection of tapestries in China and jade from the flowery land, had chosen the play for her first theatre visit after the Jubilee. Her choice had not been arbitrary. The use of Chinese things in Mary's public life has been described as a powerful denial of the decolonisation demands of the new China. That imperial attitudes continue to shape interest in Chinese things in Britain, sorry I can hear the, it's gone, um, is further demonstrated by analogies drawn between Lady Precious Stream and material Chinese objects. So Lady Precious Stream was described in chinoiserie terms as a delicate fancy, a cup of the finest porcelain filled to the brim with the unbelievable, while for J.B. Priestley it was like a willow pattern plate. But such chinoiserie interpretations had an important function. The relegation of Lady Precious Stream to a static object among objects worked to contain its subversive political agenda. Delighting in the surface decoration and fancifulness of the play enabled a disavowal to its challenge to the imperial and racial order. Chinoiserie fantasies were not restricted to cultural objects, however. One reviewer remarked that, to do justice to Lady Precious Stream, one would like to have the pen of Ernest Brahma or become Kai Lung for a while. So Brahma was the author of chinoiserie stories and Kai Lung his central character, a supposedly Chinese storyteller who spoke in a flowery, mock Mandarin style. Such was his popularity that a group of politicians and literary men set up a Kai Lung club and wrote to each other in this style. The pleasures of simulating Chineseness simultaneously destabilised but also reinstated the racial and colonial order. Following one production of Lady Precious Stream, a journalist wrote of meeting the most honourable buddy, the lordly, the lordly little peaky who rules Miss Price with many bamboo rods of iron. And he says, all I got was noe, noe, bow wow wowie, which is Pekingese for I've had a lovely time in Eastbourne, but I have an engagement at the Little Theatre tonight. So I said, goodbye, Lord Precious Buddy Buddy. We don't eat dog in England. I'm wondering if dogs ever eat men in China. So as we know, Price um, did indeed own a Pekingese dog. But the anthropomorphism of this comment also suggests that the sh journalist may have been referring to Shung, and with a mimicking of pidgin English affects the association between Chinese and dogs so redolent of imperial, imperialist attitudes to China. The dehumanisation of the Chinese was common in chinoiserie plays, and we heard earlier um, about the comic names given to um, the Chinese on a pantomime stage. So the main character in one play, um, one play, um, The Mandarin's Daughter of 1851, was named Chim Pan Si. Um, and this kind of um, dehumanisation continued in events surrounding Lady Precious Stream. So in 1935, Lady Astor held a most unusual and interesting entertainment in the aid of Lime, uh, Limehouse Children's Charity. The press described how London society people were able to enjoy the pleasures of variety theatres when, in willow plate fashion, strange Chinese were brought in to perform in front of a backdrop of ancient things. Against old, chi old tapestries in Lord Astor's drawing room, Chinese tumblers put themselves into extraordinary shapes. The entertainment also included a children's performance of another of Shung's play, 
Mencius was a bad boy, of which, says the journalist, not least of the attraction was to hear the little slit-eyed oriental personalities speaking in purest East End English. As late as in the 1950s, the BBC referred to Xiong as a Chinaman, whilst in the 1960s he was described as almost as delicate and as diminutive as the Chinese, Chinese art treasures that he owned, and again likened to a static object or perhaps a miniature figurine. So the construction of Lady Precious Stream as Chinoiserie and Chinoiserie imaginings of Xiong and other Chinese people as comical uh, curious creatures, even things, were necessary to contain the threat posed by their subjectivity and agency and to maintain the weakening racial and colonial order. This becomes even clearer when considering how Lady Precious Stream was in fact hailed by some as a great modernist work for its non-naturalistic style. For in those cases, its modernism was attributed to Price. So as one critic um, wrote... Miss Price has introduced to audiences the beauty of convention and therefore of order in art. Her stage is what, um, what every stage essentially should be. The mind delights in its newfound liberty to imagine, and the eye gives it just enough ground for invention. We are free. When Shung is mentioned, it is only as Price's assistant. She has had the help of, its, uh, of the author, Mr. S.I. Shung. In another review proclaiming that Lady Precious Stream made a big step forward in a renaissance of theatre, Shung's role was again obliterated, while Price and her company earned not only the um, admiration, but the gratitude of all lovers of the beautiful art of the stage. So Lady Precious Stream could point the way forward for modern theatre, but its innovations could not be attributed to Shung. So... Um, in essence, Shung's um, success was mixed. Um, he had um, great success with um, becoming so famous through Lady Precious Stream and continued to um, write on a variety of Chinese um, issues. But arguably, he remained a native informant, um, a valued authority, but only on things Chinese. He continued to um, try and challenge misconceptions of the Chinese through subsequent works, most of which... Um, focus on the social and political realities of modern China, but these never managed to replicate the success of Lady Precious Stream. And even after his other works had had their day, Lady Precious Stream continued to circulate Shinwazri ideas of Chineseness worldwide. So here are two actors backstage in a performance in Israel, 1952, and another when it was performed in a colonial production at Kenya National Theatre in Nairobi. So to conclude... The British love affair with Chinoiserie did not radically alter um, attitudes towards the Chinese. Xiong's attempt to construct a modern national identity via an adaptation of a Peking opera contributed to the vogue for things Chinese, but coincided with the British recourse to Chinoiserie as a vehicle through which to reinstate an increasingly fragile imperial identity. Although exhibitions of Chinese people popular in the 19th century were no longer held, Chinoiserie plays in yellow face and Chinoiserie fashions for Chinese dress, objects and performance continue to con contribute to the consumption of Chinese things and people as exotic curios. By erasing con uh, Xiong's contestation of Chinoiserie and attributing the play's modernist import to Nancy Price, responses to Lady Precious Stream excise the political, moral and creative agency of Xiong and Chinese people more widely. British investments in fanciful visions of China were thus not purely aesthetic. And consequently, Chinoiserie can be understood not only as a term applied to objects or cultural forms in a Chinese style, but as a practice and mode of discourse that is constitutive of the racial formations of modernity. Chinoiserie not only shaped British modernism, but was central to its racial politics and its darker side is apparent in serving to maintain the colonial and racial order by excising not only from modernism, but also from modernity, the Chinese. Thank you.